I'd like to personally thank you for tuning in to this broadcast. At Highview Baptist Church, we exist to lead people to know and follow Jesus. We're so thankful that you're taking the time to dig into God's Word with us. And we'd encourage you to check Highview out more on our website at highview.org. We hope and pray that the Lord is speaking to you in and through His Word and that you truly will come to know and follow Jesus. have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to John chapter 13. That's where we're going to begin this morning in our journey. As you're getting there, man, I'm just so thankful for our church and man, that choir, Isaac up here. I mean, like, is that incredible? I mean, absolutely incredible. I mean, I basically got a workout just watching them this morning. I mean, I, I feel I got my steps in. I mean, like, unbelievable. But what a privilege we have as a church to have such incredible leaders leading us out in just singing out to our Lord. This morning, we're going to take a journey. We're going to walk with Peter. It's a character study that we're going to walk with in Scripture this morning. Because we will know, and you've already seen, it's already been witnessed, the truth of the resurrection, that he is not here. Why are you seeking the living among the dead? He is risen. Through the eyewitness accounts that we have, you can know the truth of the resurrection. But here's the question. Will you know the power of the resurrection? We know the personal application of the resurrection upon our lives because Jesus truly has defeated sin and death. It says, according to the scriptures, that because of that in Corinthians, it says that all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. It's in him that there's the forgiveness of sin. According to Luke chapter 24, Jesus instructed his disciples that because of the resurrection, that we are called upon to proclaim repentance and the forgiveness of sin in his name. And that's what we're going to do today. We are going to proclaim the repentance and the forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus. But in this story and in this progression, it begins first with defeat and failure for us to fully understand and grasp what Jesus really wants to do and can do in our lives. So in the honor of God's word, if you're able and willing, I'd be asked you to stand this morning and let's begin our journey in John chapter 13, beginning in verse Number 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, Lord, we come before you in your word. Father, please help us to understand clearly who you are, what you have done and what you can do in our lives. Father, please break down any barriers, anything that keeps us from you, any distractions. Father, we just pray right now that you help us just to zone in, focus upon you, and Lord, to hear you speak directly to us. And we pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. What is worse? What is worse than failure is predicted failure. Here, Jesus says to Peter, will you die for me? He says, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. The moment you know, the moment Peter hears these words, you know pride rose up. You know in that moment, Jesus, you're wrong. No way am I gonna do that. You know that I'm better than the rest of these disciples. You know that I'm gonna follow you wherever you go. You know I will lay down my life for you. There's nothing worse than predicted failure because we we don't want to walk into it. We will do whatever we can to avoid it. But we know the reality. If you know the story, you know that Jesus knows. He knows who we are. He knows what's taking place in us, in us right now. He knows what we have done. He knows what we are thinking. And he knows what we are going to do. And here the story really becomes the life when we understand that Jesus is reaching in and he's giving a clear predicted failure of Peter. And so let's look at the progression. Turn with me to John chapter 18. John chapter 18, verse number 15. The events of the crucifixion in the garden, we're progressing now. 
It says in verse number 15, Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. Since the disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? And he answered, I am not. Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire. Please note that detail. Please understand and please put that in your mind. Note that detail because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you also are not one of the disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I'm not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked him, did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter again denied it at once and a rooster crowed. Here comes an episode of John recording exactly what that denial looks like. And in Matthew and in Luke and Mark, there's some other, some other details that are given to us that kind of bring it to life where Peter was so adamant about not knowing Jesus that he literally was going to curse, take the Lord's name in vain. He was so adamant that he did not know him and wanted nothing to do with Jesus. I mean, the denial was full. It was complete. It was not done in secret. It was done in public. He is denying knowing Jesus. This is Peter. Peter has walked with Jesus. This is Peter who has witnessed Jesus feeding the 5,000, calming the storm, seeing Jesus transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is Peter who's been, had a front row seat to all the ministry of Jesus, who has loved him, who's fallen in love with him, who gave the great confession of who Jesus is, that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. And here in this moment of pressure, in this moment of peer pressure, he is denying even knowing him. Luke chapter 22 gives us a detail and an insight that's really important. Luke records this, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Can you imagine that moment? Can you imagine Jesus telling you you're going to fail? You actually fail. You do exactly what he said he's going to do. And the moment you did in that third time, you turn around and Jesus is looking right at you. And that gaze captures you. And you remember immediately your sin and your failure. And Peter runs. He gets out of there and he doesn't just weep. He doesn't just cry. He weeps bitterly. There is a deep seated, I mean, just grief and sorrow that is taking place. And it's the last thing he ever did and saw Jesus with. Let that hit you. Because the crucifixion takes place. Jesus dies on that cross. Jesus was buried in that tomb. And Peter is left with his sorrow and his grief weighing upon him that the last thing he did was deny his Lord. He denied Jesus. So do you think on that run to the tomb that was filled with emotion? Do you think the moment he heard the news that Jesus is alive and he hears it and he runs to the tomb, do you not think that somehow it was so filled with emotion? Like, what is he gonna find? Is Jesus really alive? I mean, there's so much grief and sorrow and hope wrapped up into that run and getting there and seeing the empty tomb. And the question you know he had to ask, if I see him, what's he gonna say to me? I'm a failure, I've denied him. What is Jesus going to do to me? So many of you, you walked in here this morning. You're invited by family and friends and you're here and you're saying, Jesus, but what what is Jesus gonna say to me? Man, I'm a failure. I have sinned. I have rebelled. Man, my, my sin is dark. What is Jesus going to say to me? And here, Jesus does appear to the disciples. He appears in the upper room twice, two Sunday nights consecutively. And nowhere in scripture is it described or given to us that he addressed Peter with anything at that moment. He's appearing to the disciples. He's showing that he's alive. He's showing that he has risen from the dead. But nowhere is there an interaction until John records it for us in John chapter 21. So if you have your scriptures, turn over with me. John chapter 21. After this, Jesus, verse number one. After this, Jesus revealed himself again 
to the disciples. It's the third time you'll see this. By the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of the disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Here's just, here's a little details. Jesus told them, go to Galilee and I will appear to you again. So they're up there waiting. I don't know what the period is, but they're waiting. And obviously there's two different ways to deal with grief and sin in our own lives. We're either lethargic, we pull, we withdraw, and we pull into our, that self-focus where we just get so tired and lazy, we do nothing. Or we're like Peter, who we are having overly abundance of ADD. And we're like running away from grief and sorrow in any way, shape, or form. And we're doing whatever activity that we could do so that we don't have to face ourselves. That's what's happening here. Peter is so just drawn, like he knows what's going on. I've got to do something. I'm going fishing. And everybody's like, I'm coming with you. So like, that's the situation we got going on here in verse number four. Just as the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple, John, who's writing, whom Jesus loved, therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish for they were not far from the land, about a hundred yards off. Man, when you're struggling, when you're trying to, I mean, in this whole relationship with the Lord, you're like, man, I'm gonna earn my way back. Here, when Peter hears that Jesus, it's Jesus on the shore, he doesn't wait for the other disciples. He does the dramatic. Man, I'm jumping in now. I'm swimming to him. I'm gonna show him how much I love him, how much I wanna be with him. I'm jumping in. I'm not avoiding. I'm jumping in. I'm going to Jesus. That's what happens sometimes. We're trying to earn it. We're trying to overly perform for our Lord. Look at verse number nine. But when they got out on land, They saw a charcoal fire in place. Do you remember, let's say for a second, do you remember the scene in the courtyard? Do you remember that there was a charcoal fire? This is a very similar scene. The Lord is bringing him back, bringing him back to remembrance, bringing him back to that moment. And here's just a side note for you. Charcoal is biblical. Gas is unbiblical. So like, I just want you guys to understand, if you're cooking with gas, you gotta change, man. You gotta change it up. Go go back to that. That was free, okay? That was free information. Here we go. He said, he saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish, this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, here comes a critical moment. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. Hang here for just a moment. There's some word plays going on. There's some things we need to know. The first that we recognize is how Jesus addresses Peter. Remember, Peter, Peter is a nickname. Peter means the rock. It was given to Peter because he made the great confession that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. That new name, Peter, signifies this new position that the Lord has given to him. But he doesn't address him by Peter, does it? He addresses him as Simon, Son of John. This is like your parents addressing you in your full name. You know something's up. Like, this is about to get serious. And so he's addressing Simon, son of John. Not with that nickname, Peter, but he's going back, back to his old life. And he asks him a question. He says, do you love me more than these? Now, Jesus uses a very specific word. We lose it in our English translations. But what he says is he addresses Peter with, do you agape me? Do you love me with a God-like love, an unconditional love. When Peter answers, though, he doesn't use the word agape. He uses the Greek word phileo, which means a brotherly love. 
He uses that, like we have the word for Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. He doesn't use the same word of agape. He uses the, what, the word for brotherly love because he's been humbled. He's not boasting any longer. He's not trying to put himself on the level of the Lord. And Jesus says, do you agape? Do you love me more than these? And in a comparison, and Peter says, you know, Lord, that I love you. I phileo you. And then Jesus says, feed my lambs. Verse number 16, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? That same word agape, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Phileo, I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. The first time Jesus is comparing his love to those around him. The second time he's just looking straight at Peter. Peter, do you love me? Do you agape me? And Peter says, you know, you know, Lord. And he comes back, not with that agape, he comes with that phileo. You know that I love you. And then Jesus says, feed my lambs. Look at verse number 17. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Which is a key because he does not use the word agape. He uses the word phileo. He's using the same word that Peter has been using and addressing him and coming back to him. So he uses that word. Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. What we need to know is that Jesus is bringing Peter right back to a moment of failure, a moment of denial, three denials, three questions, because he's bringing what only he can bring, and that's the forgiveness of sin. He's bringing Peter back to an awkward moment. He's bringing him back to a difficult moment. Why we know this? Because Peter says he's grieved to the heart. Peter knows exactly what he's doing. The disciples know exactly what he's doing. Jesus is canceling Peter's debt. Hear that. We live in a cancel culture, which is terrible, but this kind of canceling is miraculous. It is amazing. It is necessary, and it is freeing. The Lord Jesus has the power to cancel our debt, to forgive our sin. And what I love about this, he walks into our world. Man, he is giving Peter a lofty expectation. Do you agape? Yet Peter can't respond that way. He knows his own heart. He knows that Jesus knows. And yet Jesus says, I'm coming to you. Hear that? The Lord Jesus comes to us. He walks into our junk. He walks into our darkness in order to rescue in order to forgive, he has the power because of the resurrection to forgive our sin. And he loves us so much that he's willing to walk in and you grab us out. And how good is the Lord in this moment? He won't let Peter take another step until that relationship is restored. Hear that. Because not only does he forgive him, but three times, what's his instruction to Peter? Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Not only is the Lord forgiving him, but he's restoring to him his place that the Lord has already formed for him, that he is to lead out, that he is to be a leader in the church. And we know that it's full. We know that it's complete because there is zero record of any disciple or of any apostle ever approaching Peter with an accusation that he is a denier. Why? Because the Lord took care of it. The Lord erased it. The Lord canceled it out. It's never to be brought up again. The Lord has forgiven and he has fully, fully restored Peter. That's the good news of the gospel. That's the good news of the scripture. We walk in here and here's the reality. The Lord does know. He knows everything. He knows everything about us. He knows our weakness. He knows our failure. He knows our difficulty, but he also knows things that we don't know. And that's the power he possesses to change our life and to see our future in light of his power and grace. Do you? Do you know that Lord Jesus can change you? Do you know that he has the power because of the resurrection to forgive and to cleanse and to restore and to change us and give us a new 
future. It doesn't have to be the same. We don't have to be in the same sin. We don't have to be trapped. We don't have to be in bondage. The Lord has the power to free us and then to send us on mission. Take a look at verse number 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. He gave a clarity about what's gonna happen in Peter's life, that there is going to be some challenges and some difficulties. But because of the Lord's forgiveness, because of the restoration, I'm telling you right now, Peter with joy was gonna walk into that difficulty for the mission of God, for the kingdom of God, and to bring glory to the Lord because the Lord has freed him. Has given him the same instruction that he gives to every person in this room, and that is to follow me. That's the first thing he said to Peter. Follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. The last thing he says to Peter is to follow me. That's our privilege. That is why we were created, is to know the Lord Jesus and to follow him, to be united with him, to become like him, to move in the same direction. We are called upon to be a worshiper of the Lord Jesus and to bring honor and glory to his name, not only for ourselves, but man, for those around us. In Luke's account of the prediction of the denial of Jesus, Jesus says this to Peter, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Jesus knew not only what Peter was going to do, but he knew exactly what he was going to do. He knew that he was gonna walk in. He knew he was gonna forgive him. He knew he was gonna restore him. And so he uses this phrase, phrase, when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. All that we've received, all that the Lord has given to us is not just for us to bury. It's not just for us to keep it in private. We are called to receive all the grace from the Lord so that we can then Strengthen those around us. Extend his love to those around us. Extend his grace to those around us. To strengthen our brothers and sisters in Christ and to see a movement of God. This is what it means and what it looks like to be on mission with the Lord. Man, the Lord has a purpose and a destiny and a direction for every one of us in this room. Don't miss it. Don't just walk in here and miss it. Don't be coming in here. And right now in this moment, don't be coming in here and be preoccupied with that which is about to take place that ham and desserts and whatever else you got going on, right? Your Easter egg hunts. Don't be distracted with that. The Lord Jesus is speaking to you right now and he is, knows your name. He knows your life and he's calling you into a relationship and no matter what you have done, he has the power to forgive and to restore and to set you on a mission to bring his name, honor and glory. That's the good news. Pray with me this morning, honey. Lord Jesus, we come before you. And Father, we are so thankful for your word. Father, we are so thankful that, Lord, you call us into a relationship. With all heads bowed, all eyes closed. The question you have to ask yourself right now in this moment, do you really know him? Do you know Jesus? And I mean, I know you know things about him, but I mean, do you know him personally? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus. The scripture says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all sinners. The scripture says that the wages of sin, that which we earn is death, eternal death, separation from God. But that scripture also says that the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That he's come and through grace, through his sacrifice, through his death, through his burial, through the power of his, res of his resurrection, he offers to us now a gift called eternal life. Even though, it says in the scriptures, even though we were sinners, Christ died for us. He knows who we are. He knows what we have done. And yet he came for us anyway. That's why the scripture says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It says in Romans 10, 13, if anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. 
Do you know him? Have you surrendered to him? 